Well, good morning. You look beautiful today. You sound beautiful today. Um, a few weeks ago, I found myself downtown Vancouver attending a conference. Now, the first two days, this is very typical of Vancouver weather, so I'm told, it rained. It rained for two straight days. But on the third day, even though the forecast was set to be overcast, uh, the sun shone brilliantly that day. Now, the plan that evening was for the delegates to meet for dinner close to our hotel. So I rushed back after the last session, and I changed and headed to the restaurant to meet everybody. Of course, the sun had continued to shine all day. And so when everyone met up, everyone decided, hey, let's, let's not go to that restaurant. Let's head downtown to the harbor to watch the sunset. The problem was that I was wearing shoes that you should not walk a dozen blocks in. So I contemplated running back to the hotel, which was very close, to change, but it was so nice outside, and I'm like, Jessica, you're still young, you're good. And so I decided to head out in that inappropriate footwear for walking. The next morning, my foot felt different. It was like there was a pain shooting into my heel, and if you've ever experienced it, you know exactly what happened in the moment. The next day, the pain was worse. And each day, the pain continued to get worse. It wasn't getting better. I was icing it, I was stretching it, nothing was working. And since one month later, I still wince every morning that I wake up and step on my foot. Plantar fasciitis. Fast forward to this week, I found myself laying head face down on a table at the physiotherapist's office, trying shockwave therapy for the very first time. Now, let me tell you, if you have never tried shockwave therapy, you are missing out <laughs> on a really good, most of you have tried it, you're missing out on a good time if you haven't. It's excruciating, it's awful. I just laid there, he did something, and I was like, what are you doing to my foot? It's hard to believe that a month of agony and intense pain could have been easily prevented if I had just made a better decision that evening in Vancouver. I learned a hard lesson on that day that bad decisions often lead to difficult outcomes, just like good decisions can lead to healthy outcomes. So today we're gonna to talk about how we can make better decisions. And we're gonna do it simply by looking at a story about a pastor who sends a letter to a group of individuals that he had pastored previously before. Let me introduce you to this guy. His name is Saul. When we first meet Saul in the Bible, he is known as a tormentor of Christians. He's an executor of Christians. It's his job to kill Christians. And then God shows up and does this radical thing in his life, and Saul's life is changed completely, 180 degrees, probably the best turnaround story that you're ever going to find about someone who did not follow Jesus to somebody who followed Jesus. It's incredible. Saul becomes a follower of Jesus, and God gives him a new name to identify that he is a new person. No longer is he going to be called Saul. His name is now going to be Paul. And Paul's job changes from a tormentor of Christians to someone who shares the gospel, the good news of Jesus. This is after Jesus has gone back to the Father in heaven. Paul becomes a missionary who travels around all over the region, sharing the good news of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for humanity. Now, Paul visits multiple places, stopping for a bit of time here and there, until he arrives in a place called Ephesus. And in Ephesus, Paul decides to stay for about a little under three years, which is interesting because it's the longest time that Paul stayed anywhere in any given location on his own. There's something really special about Ephesus. In those days, Ephesus was a central place on the map. Can we go back to the slide there? Perfect. Um, so we have Ephesus right here. It's actually in the middle of on the way between Rome and Jerusalem, a route that many people would have traveled all the time. And so you have to go through Ephesus often to get to Jerusalem or to get to Rome. So many people passed through Ephesus, which is likely one of the reasons why Paul chooses to stay there for a long period of time. You see, if Paul could share the good news of Jesus with the people of Ephesus, they in turn could eventually share the good news of Jesus with everyone 
that would pass through Ephesus. So sharing Jesus with Ephesus was a wise decision on Paul's part. We can go to the next perfect. Thank you. This is a drawing of Ephesus. It's not an actual picture. You can tell that. But this gives you an idea of what Ephesus looked like. Ephesus was a grand city. It housed a library that had over 12,000 scrolls. Scholars think between 12,000 and 15,000 scrolls, making it an intellectual's dream city. Keep in mind that most places only had a few handful of scrolls if they were lucky. This was an incredible place where you could gain incredible knowledge. Ephesus was the place to be. It also had a great theater. It was a grand theater. You could go there for entertainment. People would gather there. It was such a large place for people to be, making it a city where knowledge was able to be shared and also community was valued. Ephesus was a great place to be. (coughs) Ephesus also had something called the Temple of Artemis, which was one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. And this temple of Artemis was actually built to house and honor the fertility goddess of Artemis. Inside the walls of the temple, you would find people worshiping the goddess and other goddesses through sorcery, through astrology, sometimes religious, hysteria. They were communicating with spirits, and they were also performing sexual acts towards the goddess. Outside the walls of the temple, you would find the sale of idols, uh, also mini amulets, so uh, necklace pieces that you could wear on your wrists, on your ankles, on your neck, that people would wear when they left the temple and come back to it. See, this pagan temple and the magical worship of gods and goddesses was a major part of the life rhythm and daily routines of the Ephesian people. So we can see that setting up shop in Ephesus was a wise decision for Paul because lots of people would travel through Ephesus on any given day. It was in the middle of the route between Rome and Jerusalem, but it was also an incredibly wise decision on Paul's part to set up shop there because it was the home of pagan worship in the region. So Paul decides to plant himself, instead of just journeying through and continuing, he plants himself for three years in Ephesus. And during that time, Paul starts a church in a school, we're told. And Paul, whose life has been radically changed by God, now begins to introduce the Ephesian people to Jesus and the way of Jesus. And then, after he's told them about Jesus and showed them what Jesus has done in his life, he then invites them to follow Jesus with him. Now, you can imagine how different Paul's teaching is compared to the religious community that these people have grown up in. See, their pagan worship practices would have encouraged them to worship many gods, to worship many goddesses. Depending on what they would need, they would go to a different god or goddess, which is a practice called polytheism. Polytheism just means the worship of multiple gods, that you can worship multiple things. Uh, They would wear those amulets around them, Uh, for protection, for blessing. They would have idols in their home that they would bow down and worship when they couldn't get to the temple. Polytheism was a part of their daily routine as people who lived in Ephesus. But Paul shows up and he begins to teach them about the one true God who sent his son Jesus to the world to die on a cross for their sins. Paul tells them about this one true God who loves them and welcomes them into his family, and he asks them to serve and worship only him, which is the practice of monotheism, the practice that I only worship one God. In Christianity, we only worship one God, God, the one true God. So Paul's teaching is very disturbing to their ways of life and the ways of the temple. And let's keep in mind that the sale of all those idols and those amulets going out outside the temple, that would have brought incredible economic dollars to the city of Ephesus. People are turning, the Bible says, from their magic books and the things, their idols, and they're deciding to read the scriptures and serve only the one true God. And the Bible says this, this went on for two years. Think about that, for 700 days. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. I think that's amazing. All the Jews and Greeks, Paul must have spent all his time doing a work for God in the city of Ephesus because everybody, after two years, has heard about this one true 
God. And this is how the church in Ephesus is born. For three years, almost, a little bit under, we read that they increase in numbers daily. Not just the people in Ephesus, but there's people coming in and out of the city. And as they travel in and out of the city, they're stopping or they're talking to people who are belonging to this church or they're stopping in the church. And the Bible tells us that they are deciding to leave their polytheism ways behind and they're deciding to worship only one true God. It's incredible. So we can't really be surprised by what happens next. Because a little under those three years in Ephesus, Paul is brought before the court in that grand theater, and he's charged with disrespecting the, guard, the goddess of Artemis through his teaching against polytheism. And as a result, Paul is forced to leave Ephesus and the church that he has started behind. Now, I can imagine how difficult that is for Paul. Because he loves this church. He's planted it. He's grown these people. He loves these people. The first group that Skip and I ever pastored together, so we had pastored individually, and then we got married, and so we started pastoring in this church together. And this group had a bunch of quirky individuals. I remember after the first Friday night at youth, I looked at Skip and said, I don't know what we got ourselves into. It was wild. It was a daunting task to look around the room and trust that Jesus was going to help us somehow uh, take these individuals and, draw, and grow them into followers of Jesus. There were some kids who were there just for games and fun. They wanted no teaching. They just wanted to have fun. They wanted pop and pizza, and they would show up if we gave them that. Uh, there was also students there with their arms crossed, scowls on their faces. Obviously, mom or dad or somebody had dropped them off, and they did not want to be there on a Friday night. I hear some giggles over there. This is the thing. I'm going to give you information. I'm going to give you some advice. Parents in the room, parents online. Um, drop your kids off at youth. Drop your kids off at youth. On Friday nights, drop them off here weekly and see what God wants to do in their life. See what God, when he will show up in their life. That's a money back guarantee. Every single time I have told parents to drop their kids off at youth. I don't, I don't care about the excuses. I don't care if they don't want to come. Don't ground them from youth. Don't say, oh, you can't go to youth if you don't fit. Like, keep youth, keep time with God as something so sacred that, they, that they're going to go to. Because here's the thing. I have told so many parents this over the years. I have never had one parent come back to me after four years and say, you were wrong. I wish I hadn't dropped my kid off at youth. What I have heard is so many parents come to me after those four years and say, you were so right. I wish that I had dropped my kids off at youth. There's a very short window. Drop your kids off at youth. That's a money back guarantee. Youth is free. So it's a guarantee. Drop your kids off at youth. That one's for free. So there were students in this group there for a good time. There were the students who were dropped off by their parents. They didn't want to be there. There were the keeners, those students who would follow us to the ends of the earth, whatever we wanted to do, they were up for. And finally, there were some socially awkward kids. There was a group of kids and in this season, in that group, there was a lot of them. And I remember on one of the first nights, I met this guy named Jay. And Jay walked up to me wearing this tan trench coat that went to the ground. And he had this like brown fedora hat on. And he had this cane. And I was like so confused. And he came up to me and he said, and what he did was he put his cane down on the ground. And he, uh, so that he could grab his hat. And he, oh, sorry, I guess it was this way. He grabbed his hat held out his hand, shook my hand, and said, hello, Pastor Jessica, I'm so glad to meet you. And he popped his hat down like a, like a gentleman might. And I was just like wild, because everything was wild that night. And he said, would you like to join me and my associates for a game of, and there was some kind of card game that they played. And he, it was just wild. Jay was weird in the most possible ways and what I learned to be the most interesting ways. And over the course of the next several years, Skip and I got to know the many different personalities that were involved in that youth group. And we've journeyed with them over the course of years as they've made bad decisions that have led them on difficult paths and good decisions that have set them out on healthy paths. And through the years, it's been a privilege to see God work in their lives. In fact, a few weeks ago, we ran into Jay, who is in fact married to somebody who was in that youth group, and he was able to share with us what God is still doing in his life. You see, pastoring is such a beautiful privilege to be invited into, to be invited into someone else's life and see how God is going to use their lives. That's one of my favorite things 
about one church to you. That lasting legacy that we celebrated last week about our lead pastors who continue to journey with our congregation. As they've passed that shepherd staff, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, you can check out our new history wall out in the lobby. As they've passed that shepherd, shepherd staff on from Pastor Mulligan to Pastor Keith to Pastor Jonathan, they continue to call One Church TO home. They continue to support the leadership and invest into the future of what God is doing here. Friends, we should be so grateful that God has allowed a legacy of leaders to remain within our church family for decades. So I can imagine the pain that Paul must have felt when he was forced to leave his congregation behind and leave Ephesus after pouring his life into them and sharing the gospel with them and helping them become followers of Jesus. He had invested into their future and I think he's still committed to seeing them soar. And that's where we pick up our story. It's been a few years since Paul has been forced to leave Ephesus. In fact, a few things have happened in Paul's life. He has continued on his missionary journey, um, and the Holy Spirit has actually revealed to him, he writes this down, that this journey will likely end in persecution and death. But Paul says, I am compelled to obey. Nothing else matters. It doesn't matter if I live or die. I will be obedient to God. And so now we find Paul stuck in prison, for sharing the gospel, which means he's unable to go and visit and check in on the people that he loves in Ephesus. So what does he do? He takes a pen and a paper, and he begins to encourage them from afar, which are known as Paul's prisons letters. Now, this is really interesting. Sometimes we read the books like Ephesians and Corinthians and the Colossians, and we just read them as if they're letters to us. Really, they're letters to churches that Paul had planted in different places. Even that passage that Pastor Matt read to us today about a communion, that was Paul writing to a church, letting them know, this is how you take the Lord's Supper. This is something that you should do. This is what Paul did when he was in prison. He wrote to the churches that he had planted and that he had loved to encourage them from afar. You see, Paul knows these people. He pastored them for a long time. He was the one to introduce them to Jesus. He's helped them learn how to become a follower of Jesus. He's taught them the ways of Jesus. Paul is for these people, and his instructions are meant to help them. Paul knows that there's a reality that even though they are followers of Jesus, they still live in a pagan culture that lives very differently than the ways of Jesus, very similar to how you and I live today. And as a part of this letter, Paul includes this beautiful excerpt teaching on how to go about making wise decisions. And that's where we're going to plant ourselves today. He says this to the church of Ephesus, pay careful attention then to how you walk, not as unwise people, but walk as wise people, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish. Understand what the Lord's will is. And don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living but be filled by the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, in hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for everything to God. And as we read this passage, there's a few things that stand out for me. The first is this. Uh, maybe the next slide. Nope, back, no worries. The first is this. Uh, he says, pay careful attention then to how you walk. Not as wise, not as unwise, but as wise people. What he's saying is make the most of your time. Understand what the Lord's will is. Don't get drunk. Be filled by the Spirit. Give thanks always for everything to God. Paul is almost, you can go back to the next slide for a second. Paul is almost giving them a pattern on how to be wise. The first thing he says is redeem your time. Redeem your time. Next, decide to obey. Don't go numb. Be spirit-led. And finally, gratitude. Let's start with redeem your time. He says, making the most of the time. There are two words 
in the Greek language that are used for time. The first one means what you're probably thinking about, the hours and minutes and days that go on a clock, on a calendar, as they tick by, kind of like sand slipping through an hourglass. That's the first use of time in the Greek language. That is not what Paul is saying. Paul is using the other word for time, which means to make the most of the time. This is a Greek word that hits on the idea of a portion or gift of time, a literal moment of opportunity, a window of opportunity that can be seized or can be squandered. See, we all have been given a certain amount of time. The hard part is we don't know how much. We don't know how much time we are going to get, but all of us, the Bible says, have been given, gifted, a moment and amount of time. And that time sits within seasons of opportunity in our lives. There may be no one who understands this concept more than a parent who is dropping off their student at university for the very first time. They've discovered the truth that little feet that run towards you eventually become big feet that step outside your home and go off into the big world. This is why empty nesters are so quick. When you have a baby, anyone ever experienced this? You're a young parent, you have a baby, and all the empty nesters descend on you. Oh, the time is so fleeting. Oh, enjoy this time. It's going to go by so fast. Let me tell you, as a young mom, it doesn't feel like that. As a young mom, it feels like it's long, like the days are never going to end, like this moment is just going to last for eternity. But they're on the other side of the parenting journey, and they know the reality that children grow up, and it is fast. They understand that there's windows of opportunities that have expiry dates. So Paul starts off this process on how to be wise by highlighting that there are appointed times for things to happen in your life. He encourages the Ephesians, pay attention. Do not put off things that you could do and should happen today. When making decisions, pay attention at the season of life you are in and if that opportunity would be available to you in the future. If it would not, what you want to do is consider seizing it today. That's exactly what Paul did when he decided to plant himself in Ephesus. The whole world needed to know about Jesus, but Paul decided there's a season of opportunity. I'm going to plant myself here for the next three years. The second step in Paul's instruction on how to make wise decisions is decide to obey. He says, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. See, Paul had taken so much time to teach the Ephesians about the scriptures. Three years almost, the Bible tells us. He had gone over what God had done for the people of Israel, how God had sent Jesus to fulfill all the promises that he had made, and how Jesus had modeled for them what it meant to obey the Father. When Paul writes, don't be foolish, but find out what the will of God is, Paul is reminding them of what he had already taught them. Even though they lived in a pagan culture, they still now belonged to a one true God. Remember that, Paul is saying. Don't look for wisdom that the world is going to give you. Pay attention to what God's will is. See, when you're making decisions, Paul is saying, remember the instructions of God and let that lead you to obedience. This is why knowing scripture is so vitally important to a follower of Jesus. How are we supposed to know the will of God if we've never taken an opportunity to read what he actually has said to us? It's like when you go and pick up Ikea furniture at the warehouse and you bring it home and you're ready to set it up. We know what it's supposed to look like. We've been in the model. It looks fantastic. But the steps that it's going to take to get that little tiny square box, I, I'm always amazed, right? Like it comes in a little box and it's supposed to like fill your entire wall. We need to know what the instructions are from getting it from that box into a piece that can be in our home. And that's only found within the instructions. Even my husband, who works with tools his entire day, every single day, in and out, week after week, eventually needs to admit that he does need to open up the instruction book and pull out that dreaded Allen key that he hates to understand what he is supposed to be doing. The same is true with God's word. We can know what a follower of Jesus is supposed to look like, but if we don't read the instructions that God has given to us, we will never get it quite right. Be kind of like that Ikea furniture, you know, that sits on an angle, so my husband just kind of drills it into the wall or whatever. We're never going to get it quite right if we haven't read the instructions that God 
has sent to us. And then when we've read his instructions, when we've read the Bible, when we understand it, we need to decide we're going to obey it. Because obedience is always a decision. It goes beyond wanting to obey. Obedience is an action word. Jesus tells this story to his followers one day of two sons. And he says this. He says, their father asks them to go work out in the field. One of them responds, I will not. But later on, he decides to obey his father and he goes out into the field. The other quickly responds, I'll do it, father. But he doesn't bother to follow through on what his father has asked of him. And Jesus asks his followers, which one of them obeyed? Was it the one who said he was going to obey, but didn't put any actions to his words? Or was it the one who said, I'm not going to obey, but ended up deciding to obey his father? You see, when Paul encourages the Ephesians to understand what God's will is, he is reminding them that God just doesn't want obedient people. He desires obedient hearts that want to follow him. See, when we decide to obey, we are deciding not just to follow the instructions that God has given to us, but to follow Jesus, to trust him and to choose obedience because we know and trust that his plans for our life are good. For followers of Jesus, and this is a hard one, obedience must trump logic at some times when it comes to decision making. There's a place for logic. We're going to get to that in a moment. But obedience is a requirement of a follower of Jesus. The third one, Paul says, don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living. Oh, this one's gonna be fun. I called it don't go numb. It's helpful to note here that he doesn't say don't drink wine. He says don't get drunk. There's a big difference. Let's remember, Paul is giving an outline to the Ephesians people, the uh, people of Ephesus, on how to make wise decisions. And he is highlighting for them here that drunks do not make good decisions. They're not good decision makers. What do we know about drunkenness? Well, first we know that alcohol is a depressant. Simply put, it depresses the body's rate to function. Alcohol is a depressant. Secondly, we know that when we are drunk, we become numb to the situation and realities around us. That's why often people drink, because there's so much going on in their life that they just want to go numb for a little bit. They want to ignore it. The third one is it impairs us from making wise decisions. We're not able to make wise decisions. We're not able to fully think through things when we're drunk because there's something impairing our thoughts, because it loosens our self-control, our balance, and our judgment. What Paul is saying here is pay attention to the things that numb you because they will restrict your ability to make good decisions and that will ruin your life. And so maybe for you, it's drunkenness isn't an issue for you. But maybe there's other ways that you numb your life so that you don't have to think about things. Like It's kind of like putting your head in the sand, not really paying attention to what's going on. But there's an antidote to numbness and it's called intentionality. Intentionality is so important when we make decisions. Andy Stanley wrote a really easy to read book. It's called Better Decisions, Fewer Regrets. Pastor Jonathan led our deacon board through this as our devotional over the past year, and we had fantastic discussions around it. I'd highly recommend you get a copy of this book. So easy to read, so easy to implement in your life. And inside this book, Andy outlines a three-step process for staying intentional when making decisions. The first step he says is this, consider your past history. Did you know that experts would tell us that the decisions that you have made in your past are actually the best indicator for the decisions that you're gonna make in the future? So the, the things that you've already decided on before, unless something else happens, I can guarantee you, you're just gonna keep making those decisions. So be intentional. Pay attention to your past history. Another one in this category can be your past family problems. See, the missteps that your generations have taken before you, even their strengths or their weaknesses that they have shown, can indicate the likelihood that you're going to choose the same path as they did. Sometimes this this goes in your favor. If they've made excellent decisions generation upon generation before you, there's a strong likelihood that you're going to continue in that track and you're going to make good decisions. That's why 
It's so important in this generation, the one that you currently live in, the one that you currently have influence in, that you're making great decisions because the generations that come before, after you will benefit from the positive decisions that you make in this generation. But there's a catch, right? The difficult decisions that generations have made before you and the patterns that you can see or the difficult decisions that you make in this generation will impact the future generations that follow you. So consider your past history. Be intentional about knowing it so that you can either change it or benefit from it. The second one is this, consider your present realities. Our last series, it was called Rewire. Uh, what, what we went through, this was an excellent way to actually figure out what your present realities are. Think about your current situation when it comes to uh, your physical health, your emotional health, your spiritual health, maybe your relational health, your mental health, even your financial health. What are the realities that are in play in those? Because if you're going to make a decision, we can't just decide, I'm going to run a marathon next week and I, I have taken no steps towards getting there. In the same way, I can't decide I'm going to buy a house next week and I've taken no steps to get a down payment ready. We need to be aware of what our current realities are, be intentional about knowing them so that we can make better decisions. The final one is this, consider your future goals. Where do you want to be in the next month? Where do you want to be in the next six months? Where do you want to be one year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now? Where do you want your career to be at, your family to be at? Where do you want your relationships to be at? See, envisioning and writing down some future goals can actually help you make intentional decisions, wise decisions, because you've already thought through them. So you, when you've asked yourself those three things, the patterns of my past, my history, the reality of my present, and the goals of my future, you want to ask yourself this one question after you've gone through those things. When I look at my past history, my present realities, and my future goals, what is the wise decision that I should make right now? See, intentionality fights against numbness, about our tendency to get numb in our lives, and we all have it. There's all areas in our lives, little pockets, that we don't want to deal with. And so we're, we go numb to them so that we don't have to think about them. And usually we don't think about them again until a problem arises. Instead, be intentional. Don't go numb. Look at all the areas, ask your questions, and then make wise decisions about your future. And so after Paul cautions the Ephesians to not go numb, he encourages them instead, be spirit-led. He says, be filled by the spirit. So what do we know about drunkenness? Well, we went over it before. It's a depressant, it numbs you, it impairs you, and it loosens your self-control, your ability, your balance. What does Paul mean when he encourages the, the Ephesians to be spirit-filled, to be led by the spirit? Well, the Bible says that if you are spirit-filled, the Holy Spirit prepares you. He also guides you. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit sanctifies your life. And sanctification, all this means is he makes you more like Jesus. And finally, he positions you so that he can use you. So interesting that Paul uses drunkenness and spirit-filled in contrasting. He says, don't do this because it's going to numb you. Instead, do this because it will position you and propel you into your future. Last month, I had the privilege of being at our young adults retreat. There was over 60 young adults there. It was a fantastic time of God just moving in their presence. It was just amazing. And we talked about what it means to be spirit-led in our lives. See, there's two options for a follower of Jesus. We can give the Holy Spirit access to parts of our lives, or we can give him access to all of our lives. I carry around a keychain at the church. If you ever find this one, it's on a purple one. You're going to want to bring it to me. It's mine. Um, it has two keys on it. The first one is this key that opens up some doors in the church. There's some doors that, that can get this key. And so if you have that key, you can get into some doors. This is a key fob. This gets into all doors at the church. And it's very easy to travel around the church and get into what doors I need to. I simply tap the key fob, a door opens to me, and I can walk into that door. This is the difference when I'm talking about some or all of your life. We can hand over the Holy Spirit a key to our lives. That means he can get into some doors. So he's going to walk into a door of your life, towards a door to your life. Maybe it's your relationships. He's going to stick the key in, try and open it. You're going to shake your head. Nope, doesn't open that door. Move on to the next one, Holy Spirit. He might get into your career. He might get into your family, but he's not going to get into every door. Or 
You hand him the key fob. If you can hand him the key fob, that gets him into every door. Then he gets to decide what areas he wants to go in, what rooms he wants to enter in, what rooms he wants to renovate and change and make them more like Jesus. As followers of Jesus, you get to decide if he gets the key or if he gets the key fob. But be very careful because if you only give him a key to areas of your life, I can guarantee you the doors that that key does not open are going to be the areas that you are going to struggle in the rest of your life as you struggle to give him certain parts of your life. Are you spirit-filled? Does the Holy Spirit have the key fob or a key to your life? Can he move in any area that he wants to? Can he speak to your career? Can he speak to your relationships? Can he speak to your character? Can he speak to the way that you run your finances? Is he allowed access to your whole life? Or does he have specific keys for specific doors? Paul knows this. If the Ephesian people can remember to allow the Holy Spirit to have free reign in their lives instead of allowing him only into certain areas, the Holy Spirit will bring discernment and wisdom as they make choices that lead them to wise decisions. And then finally, Paul instructs them to remember gratitude, giving thanks always for everything to God. See, Paul encourages them to sing songs of thankfulness, to remember to give God thanks in every single season they find themselves in. As they're making decisions, thank God. To literally name the things that he has done for them and the things that they are grateful for. To declare the areas of their lives that they have seen his hand move in and to speak specifically to the things that he has done for them. Now, if you're like me, you might be asking, why gratitude? It seems an interesting choice for Paul because remember where he is. He's sitting in the middle of a jail cell and he's saying, thank God, sing praises, sing hymns, thank him. I think Paul is telling them to lift their voices in thankfulness, even as he's in that jail cell, because he knows that gratitude is what turns our eyes to God. And Paul knows that eyes that are set on God are the best indication of making wise decisions. I imagine as he was writing those encouraging words to the Ephesians, he would have been reflecting and meditating on all the scriptures that he had studied his entire life, the scriptures that he had taught them in Ephesus, passages that would have contained promises, like the one in Proverbs 3 that says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek God's will in everything that you do, and God will show you which path to take. You see, by reminding them to look to God, he was reminding them that God is faithful. Paul was, knew that gratitude would stir up their faith. Like that song that we sang together, come, come on heart, come on soul, remember who God is. Friends, Paul knew that if we fixed our eyes on God, as we read scriptures, as we choose intentionality, when we invite the Spirit to have access to every area of our lives, as we practice gratitude, our eyes would remain fixed on God, and it would allow him the ability to provide the wisdom and the discernment we all so desperately need to make decisions in our lives. Because here's the truth, friends. If you hear nothing out of this whole series, here's the truth. God is the one that gives wisdom and discernment. We can be wise, we can make wise decisions, but it's he that gives us the wisdom and discernment. It's him that knows the paths that are good for us to take, and if we go to him, he will show them to us. As we close, I wanna pray with two groups of people today. Maybe you're facing a big decision in your life. Maybe you need discernment to decide which path to take. I wanna pray with you today, and I wanna ask God to give you that discernment to give you that wisdom that he promises that he's going to give to you. In just a moment, Pastor Matt is going to invite our elders to join us at the front. And if you need somebody to partner with you for a decision that you're about to make, I'm going to invite you in just a moment to join us here at the front as our elders are available. But I also want to pray with people who might identify with letting go of areas in your life that you're trying to control and lock the Holy Spirit out of. I want you to think about that for a moment. Are there areas of your life that you have locked the door and he does not have access to 
that door. Maybe you'd admit, Pastor Jessica, I haven't invited him into this area of my life. Or maybe you've never. This is like a new concept for you. You've never considered inviting the Holy Spirit to have access to your life. Today you might be recognizing that this is the starting point of addressing some of your bad decisions that you've made in your life. Those problem areas that you just keep having issues in, maybe it's because the Holy Spirit does not have access to that room in your life. And if that's you, I'm going to pray that God would help you to release the grips that you're currently holding and help you to hand over a key fob so that he can access the areas that he wants to. The Bible teaches us that the Holy Spirit knocks on the doors of our hearts and he waits for us to let him in so that he can step in and he can help us and he can change us and he can provide wisdom and discernment. So friends, let's turn to the one who is the one who is able to help us make wise choices in our lives. Father, I thank you that you have provided wisdom and discernment You are a good father that provides the things that we need. I think of when Jesus went to heaven and said, I am going to send you the Holy Spirit and he will be with you. And I thank you that you are. So Holy Spirit, would you give us wisdom? Would you give us discernment for those of my friends who are facing big decisions in their future, God? Even now in this week, God, would you provide discernment and wisdom that they might be able to see the path that you want them to go on, God. That they may be able to put some of these things into practice, God, to be intentional about their lives, to fight against numbness. Instead of not paying attention, to look at the areas that you are prodding them to look in, God, and make changes with the wisdom that you are offering, God. And God, I think of my friends who might admit, the Holy Spirit does not have access to my life. God, I pray that you'd forgive us. God, I think that could be said of all of us. There are areas in our lives, there are areas in my life that I would prefer you not to walk into that room, God. Even now, God, God, would you help us to open those doors? Would you help us to give you a key fob to our lives so that you could enter into any room you want, God? God, we declare that you are welcome in our lives. You're welcome in this place. And we thank you for leading us. In your name, amen.